Chapter 5. Faith. Ask and it will be given you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receive, and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks the door will be opened. Jesus. What could Jesus have meant when, speaking as one having authority, he made such a sweeping and to the poor human mind almost incomprehensible statement as that quoted above? We pray, we ask, believing that we are going to receive, but we receive not. Again and again this happens until we grow sick and our courage fails because of our unanswered prayers and we begin to say, God does not answer, I don't have sufficient faith or the right kind of faith. Because of repeated failures we are benumbed and know we still pray, we seldom expect an answer. Is not this so? Where is the trouble? Many Christians mistake hope for faith. Hope expects an answer sometime in the future. Faith takes it as having already been given. Hope looks forward. Faith declares that she has received even before there is the slightest visible evidence. Our way is to declare something done after it has become obvious to the senses. God's way is to declare done before there is anything whatever in sight. God calls into existence the things that do not exist. Romans 4.17 This declaring, it is finished, when there is still no visible evidence, has power to bring the desired object into visibility. The worlds were prepared by the word of God. God is declaring that it was done, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. That is, things that are seen were not made of visible, but of invisible substance by the spoken word of God. If we expect anything from God, we must conform to his way of working. Listen to Paul's definition of faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. In other words, faith takes right hold of the invisible substance of the things desired and brings it into the world of evidence or visibility of the things that before were not seen. There is but one substance from which the real of all things is made. This substance is ever-present but invisible. It is all around us and fills the universe as the atmosphere we breathe covers the earth. In it we live and move and have our being, for it is a divine presence or substance. It is the unseen, but real and eternal, that always stands under and within the seen but temporal. Faith upon which depends all answers to prayer is not, as many earnest, sincere people suppose, a sort of -of will-o'-the-wisp mental condition that is difficult to catch and hold. If this were so, the child of God might well despair. But there is a faith that might be called understanding faith, that is based upon principles as unerring as those of mathematics. It was of this faith that the man of Galilee spoke when he said, All things can be done for the one who believes. Jesus invariably spoke as one having authority. He had proved that wherever he spoke, and he knew positively. He knew that all God's dealing with man were based upon an immutable law, a law that, if complied with, is bound from its very nature to work out certain results, no matter who or what manner of man it is that complies with the law. He never went into detail as to how or why God's law work, but positively, in a few concise words, he spoke the law and left the working of it to be proved by whosoever will. What is this understanding faith upon which the literal fulfillment of all God's promises rest? There are some things which God has so indissolubly joined together that it is impossible for even him to put them asunder. They are bound together by fixed immutable laws. If we have one of them, we must have the other. This must be illustrated by the laws of geometry. For instance, the sum of the interior angle of a triangle is equal to two right angles. No matter how large or small a triangle, no matter where we find it or who finds it, if we are asked the sum of its angles, we can unhesitantly answer that it is just two right angles. This is absolutely certain. It is certain even before the triangle is drawn by visible lines. We can know it beforehand, because it is based on unchangeable laws on the truth or reality of the thing. It was true just as much before anyone recognized it as it is today. Our knowing it or not knowing it does not change the fact. Only in proportion as we come to know it as an eternally true fact can we be benefited by it. It is a simple fact that 1 plus 1 equals 2. It is an eternal truth. You cannot put 1 and 1 together without 2 resulting. You may believe it or not, that does not alter the fact. But unless you do put the one and one together, you do not produce the two, for each is eternally dependent on the other. The world of spiritual things is governed by law just as unalterable and unfailing as is the law governing the natural world. 
The so-called supernatural is not beyond law by virtue of being above natural law. It is simply the working of a higher law than any that we, with our limited understanding, have heretofore known. And it is because it operates in a higher realm that we have not understood. When we come into harmony with this higher law, we instantly have all the power of God working with us for the very thing we pray for and we get it. Sometimes a soul comes into this harmony by childlike intuition, and he receives answer to a prayer. But we can know the law and put ourselves consciously in harmony with it. The promises of God are certain, eternal, unchangeable truth that always have been and always must be, whether in this age or another, whether on the mountaintop or under the sea. A promise according to Webster's Dictionary gives reason to expect something. It is a declaration that gives to the person to whom it is made the right to expect, to claim the performance of whatever is promised. God has bound himself to his children by promises innumerable, and he has magnified his word above all his name. I bow down toward your holy temple, and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. Psalm 138.2 When God made a promise to Abraham, because he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, human beings of course, swear by someone greater than themselves, and an oath given as confirmation puts an end to all dispute. In the same way, when God desired to show even more clearly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that through two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible that God would prove false, we who have taken refuge might be strongly encouraged to seize the hope set before us. God is our all-sufficiency in all things. He is the infinite supply above all that we ask or think, of all that the finite creature can possibly need or desire. The promises are already given. The supply, though unseen by mortal eyes, is at hand. Before they call, I will answer. Isaiah 65, 24. My God will fully satisfy every need of yours according to his riches and glory. But he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder, and the reward is well of them that diligently seek him. Here are the two fundamental principles of which rests the whole secret of understanding faith. First, the supply forever awaits the demand. Second, the demand must be made before the supply can come forth to fill it. To recognize these two statements as truth and affirm them persistently is to comply with the law of God's giving. Faith has nothing to do with visible circumstance. The moment one considers circumstance, one lets go of faith. When Jesus recognized the unchangeable fact that the supply of every want awaits just at hand, though unseen, and said, Everyone who asks receive. He was simply stating the truth as unalterable, as that of cause and effect. He knew that there need be no coaxing or pleading, for God has answered before we ask. Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Believe that you have received it, present tense. Ah, this is the hard part. Believe that you will receive them. Yes, this is easier. But to say a thing is done when there is no sign of it anywhere, can we do this? Yes, we can, and we must if we would obtain an answer to our prayer. This is the faith on which all receiving depends, calling that which is not as though it were simply because God has said so, and holding to it unwaveringly by positive and continued affirmation that is done. This is our part of the contract. This is complying with God's law of supply. God said, I am, not I will be. When he gave his name to Moses, he said, I am to each of us today, and then he leaves us to fill in whatever we pray and ask for. I am health, I am strength, I am supply, success, anything we dare take for him. How are we to take that which we desire? This taking is purely a mental process. When Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus to perform the mighty miracle, he did not plead for help, but he lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me. So remember in God's law of supply and demand, we begin to thank him, and he has made himself our abundant supply, and that before we have called, he has provided that for which we are about to ask. We continue to thank him that we do have, not shall have, the petition desired of him, and in confidence, but silently and positively, we affirm over and over again that we have it in possession. We must be persistent and unyielding. God said to Joshua, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, 
I have given to you. And he says it to us in every act of prayer. Every place that you stand firmly and determinately upon in affirmation, that have I given you. Dare to claim it. Put your foot firmly upon your claim and you shall have it. Have faith in what you are doing because you are working with God's own unfailing, unchangeable law and you cannot fail. Even in the midst of illness, calmly and confidently affirm, God is in me, my full abundant health now in spite of this appearance. For has he not said, I am? Jesus said, Do not judge by appearance, but judge with right judgment. In lack of whatever kind, ask and believe that you receive, that is, ask and begin immediately to affirm, even in the absence of any visible evidence. God is, not will be, my supply right here and now. Be determined about it. He will surely manifest himself according to his promise. Whatever you ask for in prayer is the only stipulation governing the relationship between us and his I am. Expecting that anything will be given tends to keep it forever a little in the future, just ahead of the now. Hard though it may be mentally to do it, we must step right over the dividing line and say, It is done. As far as God's part is concerned, everything has already been given us in Christ, who is the whole fullness of deity bodily. Christ is here present, not far off. Though it is invisible to our mortal eyes, all we are capable of desiring is here now. For in him, every one of God's promises is a yes. For this reason, it is through him that we say the Amen, which means that they are all fulfilled now in him. All things are in Christ, and Christ is in you. You have come to fullness in him. Then can we not say in faith, all things are mine in here and now. Persistent, unwavering affirmation that it is done and is made visible now brings into manifestation whatever one asks for or desires. End of chapter.